All right, thank you for the invitation to present our work. Um, Account is a newly funded uh, collaborative center, um, and I'll describe kind of the workings of it. And um, we came up with the acronym ACCOUNT because we want to account for the variation that affects drug response in African Americans, but we had to stretch a little bit to get the acronym. So it's African American Cardiovascular Pharmacogenomics Consortium. And um, so, uh, we've talked a lot about uh, pharmacogenomics affecting the tails of the distribution, so people in the tails, the ones that benefit from uh, genomically guided therapy. And I, I want to kind of think about that in context of minority populations. So uh, this pie graph here was published in Science. They actually updated this, I believe, in 2016, showing the number of GWAS studies done uh, by ethnicity. And as you can see, most of them are done in European populations with about 4% in non-European populations. The pie piece that would be African Americans would be even smaller than that. And what are we missing when we don't look at populations outside of European ancestry populations? Well, I'm sure all of you in this, is, this room, I'm preaching to the choir with this, is that African ancestry populations have more genomic variation than any other population on Earth. Therefore, they carry variants first, more spe variants specific to their population, and at frequencies that are quite different from European populations. And I would dare say that many times they carry actionable variants that are at higher frequencies. So that tail, perhaps, uh, theoretically and sometimes practically, as we have found out, is broader for African Americans. More of them will have variants that affect pharmacogenomic um, response than um, perhaps the European population, which we have based a lot of our economic modeling on as well. So with that, I want to just talk about the goals of account. This is a U54 collaborative grant funded through NIMHD. Uh, we are not yet fully at a year of funding yet, so we just began this. And this is a collaborative center through two major US cities. Uh, Washington, D.C., and Chicago. And so at the end of this, there's a short list of people, but I couldn't list all of them. And this is a very large grant with lots of people con contributing. Um, the goal was to accelerate discovery and translation in African Americans, and we'll t think about that. I'll talk about that in a moment. To build infrastructure for continuing this work, uh, which is very limited in this account proposal, but really um, needs to be broader to provide uh, publicly uh, available data. This was a piece that I added because it's so critical for pharmacogenomics to move forward that we have publicly available de-identified data on minority populations. And critical in doing the things we want to do in pharmacogenomics for a minority population that has previously been uh, mistreated by the medical community is to have engagement of the African American community. And so that was built very purposely, purposefully into this grant. Um, so much of what we've discussed today have, has been in this space right here, implementing all the findings over many decades of work. Uh, however, as I pointed out, much of these findings have been in European populations. And so the genomic studies, the outcome studies, these have uh, really not been performed in African Americans. And we don't always know even what we need to genotype to implement in these populations. So we're still stuck in this discovery phase. And this requires that all the, all the centers here that have talked about building platforms and genotyping, um, they're here. A and we're going to have to fit in on the back end for African Americans to benefit from precision medicine if we do not accelerate the pace of discovery and translation uh, for this group. So um, the center has two major projects. And as you'll see, there's also offshoot projects that will come out of this. The first is a discovery project. And as we said, this, this is about implementation, but we still don't even know what we should be genotyping in African Americans. Uh, for many drugs. Uh, I can only talk about a few that we'll be recruiting for, but I'd say this is probably true for many of the things we already have drug gene pairs for. Um, this will be an outpatient study. Again, this will be done across six um, medical centers, uh, three, in, three in DC, three in Chicago. And these are the kinds of data that we'll be getting. So they're different drugs, but we'll get clinical response, DNA. And in the, in the hope of building um, 
resources for people looking at minority um, genomics and pharmacogenomics. We'll be getting um, blood mRNA to hopefully do a whole transcriptome as well as splice variants. There, there's a side project uh, built into the grant for splice variant um, in population-specific splice variants. And we've tr now tried to build in an IPSC uh, library component as well. All of these will be deposited into an African-American genomics commons, and I I'll describe that uh, in kind of broad strokes in a moment, but this will be a uh, open resource that will be de-identified data that links clin clinical data, DNA data, transcriptome data all together, as well as tools that may be needed specifically for admix populations such as African-Americans. The drugs we started with in the discovery project were warfarin, the new oral anticoagulation agents, and clopidogrel. Um, these will be, again, recruited from six different centers with different phenotypes depending on the drug. And as you'll see, there's a translational project here that um, we hope that findings what, if we find something new, specifically, will feed into this translational project. But this translational project is not dependent on the discovery project alone. As new discoveries come in related to African American pharmacogenomics, we hope that they will also feed into the uh, translational project. And we wanted a translational project that was flexible in its ability to deliver pharmacogenomics to the patient, and I, I hope to show you that. So the translational project, which is led out of the University of Chicago by uh, Dr. Peter O'Donnell, will be an inpatient cohort of African Americans that will, there's, there's actually two different cohorts, I've only represented one here. What the, the specific cohorts will have standard of care or GPS guided therapy, and I'll show you what GPS is in a moment, with uh, clinical outcomes which will depend um, mainly on the size of the p population we are able to recruit, but there's a second cohort that will be a general hospitalized African-American cohort, which will also implement GPS in. And this will be um, an ability for us to see the kinds of drug green pairs that are specific for this population. So um, the GPS was built out of the 1,200 uh, patients project that uh, Dr. O'Donnell led, and this is a graphic that I probably shamelessly stole from one of his publications, uh, where he enrolls patients, uh, takes blood, and then there's preemptive pharmacogenomic genotyping, um, which is then delivered back to the physician through the GPS portal, which I'll show you in a moment. And so the physician has pharmacogenomic uh, information at the point of prescribing, which is, uh, you know, really the goal for pharmacogenomics, and I put CPIC here because, of course, they helped us, uh, the guidelines that were developed through CPIC helped determine some of the um, actionable items that go into the GPS. Um, I should note that currently there are uh, 51 drug gene pairs um, in GPS um, with uh, greater than 250 um, CDS reports. This is the newest pharmaco uh, CPIC guideline for warfarin, and these blue, this blue area here is actually what's specific if you are African American. So there are specific variants that affect African American dosing of warfarin, which um, would kind of shunt you into this um, decision uh, tree. And I told you about the, 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 uh, the tails of that distribution being bigger for African Americans, so this variant here down at the bottom, which was a part of a consortium effort that I was also a part of, uh, discovered this variant is at a minor allele frequency of 23% in African Americans. That means 47% of African Americans carry this variant. They have something that would predict a change in their warfarin dose. So none of these um, variants have been accounted for in the clinical trials we've been talking about thus far. Um, Part of dealing with an African-American or African ancestry population is that race is a social construct. There is no real biological meaning to race. African-Americans are admixed between Europeans and Africans. And most of the work that has been done to identify variants that affect African-Americans have done some um, data cleaning prior to doing the analysis, meaning that they wanted a, a group of African-Americans with a certain amount of Africanness when they run those uh, GWAS um, studies or even, even the Canada gene-based studies. Um, 
But that is not how people identify themselves. They do not think of themselves as a certain amount of African ancestry. So the complexity of implementing pharmacogenomics, once we go outside of a European population, may involve figuring out the African ancestry of African Americans. And, and this is a, just some pilot data using the GPS panel of SNPs to, to figure out if we were able to correctly classify people as greater than 70% African in, um, ancestry, which is uh, kind of the non-scientific cutoff for most people using uh, doing trials in African Americans or pharmacogenomics in African Americans. So this data is, if you use all 1,000 genomes um, patients, you can see the purple dots are the African Americans, and they fall on this um, axis between Europeans in blue and Africans in red, the green are Asians. This is if we only use the SNPs available in the preemptive genotyping panel. As I said, there are much fewer of them than in a thousand genomes, um, a thousand genomes uh, data set. But again, we're still able to classify them or group them here, the Africans, the Europeans. The yellow dots are actually the white patients in, thousand, in the preemptive genotyping panel. And the purple are the African Americans. And using a cutoff of 70%, 70% African ancestry, uh, we had a positive predictive value of 97.8%. So we are able to reliably pick out African Americans just using the SNPs on a preemptive panel. Uh, the negative predictive value is about 56%. So there are people right at the border of 70% that we will say with our preemptive panel are not 70% are not or greater African ancestry, but truly are. So we're erring on the side of caution using this method. Um, I will say for the recruitment that's currently going on in account, we are using self-identified race uh, with the hopes of implementing this sort of um, more computational method um, when, as, as, we, as we get going. This is a screenshot of GPS to show you the interface with the physician once the preemptive genotyping results are back. So there's a um, traffic light signal, and uh, green means the genotyping came back, but there's no variant that would affect the, the drug listed here. Uh, yellow means there's some evidence, and as you click on these, you will get a short um, kind of pharmacogenomics consult report. And I believe Peter says 30 seconds to read it, Peter? 30 seconds, uh, which is, a, I, I'll insult all the physicians in here, is the attention span of an MD doing this sort of work. Um, then for warfarin, he, he invented this very new symbol here, which is a pill bottle with a decrease, a down arrow, showing that this patient requires a lower dose than um, average for the, for the drug. Uh, there are also link outs here that will take you to more of the literature supporting um, these recommendations. Um, I just want to touch on the other pieces outside of the science for account. So we have an active patient engagement and advocacy um, a core led by Dorian Miller at University of Chicago. There will be community-based research through pilot grant uh, applications that are part of this um, uh, center. We have interactions with PCORI Patient Clinician Advisory Committee. We have developed our own community and stakeholder advisory board. And we've sought representation from different institutions and entities in both DC and in Chicago. And um, this is a really vital piece for anything you do, um, for anything we do in an African American or minority community. Um, this is our website. It has not gone live yet, but it, I hope that it will go live in about two or three weeks. And it's part of the, um, the implementation core. So there is an implementation um, aim to everything we do, and that will start with education of both patients and providers. Uh, those um, resources will be available on, on site as well as descriptions of the projects um, and, uh, and kind of the results um, and meetings and, and, uh, and a, as well as a link out to the data. Uh, the common data that we will be making available. So um, we're developing the, the educational tools that will be hopefully for physicians, PharmDs, as well as patient educational tools. 
This is the African American Data Commons. This is done in collaboration with uh, Bob Grossman. He also is the architect for the uh, NCI uh, Genomic Data Commons. So um, he has a lot of experience in taking genomic data and using um, uh, structures to de-identify them, uh, uh, make them available in usable formats for the scientific public. So uh, this is in collaboration also with Stanford. Uh, where we're building relevant data models and elements that then will be um, made available to the public as the data comes through. Um, and this is just a, a mock-up of, of a previous data model they built for a different consortium. So um, I feel that this is a very important piece of what we do as a person who works in African-American pharmacogenomics, finding other data sets that have genomic data and clinical data even to validate findings that we have is um, nearly impossible. So as you can see, this is a, a busy graphic where the two projects, discovery and translation, are really in the core of what ACCOUNT is hoping to uh, accomplish, speeding up the process of discovery, translating into the clinic, and then hopefully building the components for implementation, not just, I, I should also say, implementation to us does not mean just um, academic medical centers, but also in community uh, centers. So we, we've made a real effort to include uh, community leaders, or community hospital leaders in our implementation core. Uh, the consortium core, uh, which works with community partners to help us uh, base our pilot projects. And again, PharmGKB has been um, a member and an advocate with us. Uh, you can see the institutions that are involved right here. And I just, for sake of completeness, you know, at Northwestern, we are not only doing account, we also have Emerge PGX. These are, you'll hear more about that from Laura. However, there are some um, uh, drug gene pairs that, that have now, are now going to be implemented into the EMR. Um, as well as, there's actually clinical CYP2C19 testing ongoing. And so, uh, one of the interesting pieces of working on account where we have three different institutions in Chicago, is they all have different ways of reporting their pharmacogenomic data, and then trying to, to harmonize that in a way in which we can uh, run a, a study like this has been uh, challenging, for sure. So with that, I will end, and uh, here are many of the main players from the different institutions that are involved, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. And while Lynn is uh, going up, we have time for one or two questions. Terry. Thanks, Manoli. Could you, could you comment on where your African American Data Commons, where does that sit? Is that part of the NIH Data Commons? Is it a separate effort? How does that work? Yes, it will be a separate effort, but um, we, we're still designing how we're going to do that. So I think in collaboration with, with Bob, we'll, we'll figure out where that sits. As of right now, it would be separate. So it would be important then to have appropriate pointers uh, among the various data to point people to it? Absolutely. And, and this data will, of course, be available on the, the regular data sites such as dbGaP and, and those places. One of the advantages of building that commons is that all of the data is together in one place so that people can incorporate all the different elements at once. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, next, Lynn Dressler, um, PGX Implementation Research Programs at Mission Health System. 